Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week and I hope everybody is gearing up for another good weekend. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about the case of Heather Elvis. And this one is kind of unsolved, kind of solved. There's lots of theories that are going around about this case. I want to know what y'all think. I'm going to tell you guys what I think. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to tell you guys the whole entire story from the best of my ability, from very public information that's already out there. And then at the end, and probably sprinkled in the middle just a little bit because yeah, but at the end, I'm definitely going to give you guys my opinions on what I think happened, what I think is right, what I think is wrong, and all of that jazz. So let's just start at the beginning. Heather Elvis was born on June 30th, 1993 in Horry County, South Carolina. She was the middle child of three to her parents, Terry and Debbie Elvis. Her younger sister's name is Morgan and her older brother's name is Christopher. Heather was known to be shy when she was little, but as she grew older and through volunteering, she became more social. Before we go any further, I did want to stop and thank today's sponsor, Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever with Fresh, never frozen, chef prepared meals delivered right to your doorstep. And if you're too busy with summer plans to cook but want to make sure you're eating well, with Factor, you can skip the lines to the grocery store, skip all the chopping, the prepping, and the cleaning up too, while also still getting the flavor and nutritional quality that you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. All you gotta do is heat and enjoy and then go back to the outside soaking up the sun and the beautiful warm weather. And if you're looking for calorie conscious options this summer, you can try delicious dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. And if you need an extra boost to support your wellness goals this summer, try the Protein Plus meals that have 30 grams of protein or more per serving. And Factor is now owned by HelloFresh. So there are a wide variety of different meals that you can choose from. And me personally, I love going back and forth between my Factor meals and my HelloFresh meals because with my Factor meals, I've got the meals right there, boom, ready to eat, pull it out the refrigerator, stick it in the microwave for a couple minutes and my meal is ready to go. If you want to try Factor, all you gotta do is go to factor75.com and use my code ChristinaRandall50 and you can get 50% off of your first box today. Yes, all you gotta do is go to factor75.com, use my code ChristinaRandall50, and find out how you can get 50% off of your first box today. Thanks again, Factor. Heather graduated from high school in 2011 and she got pretty independent really fast. She actually moved out of her parents' house and got a roommate. She got an apartment in Carolina Forest and her roommate's name was Brianna and she was from out of state. Heather began working as a hostess at the Tilted Kilt in Myrtle Beach while studying cosmetology. So in 2013, while Heather was working at the Tilted Kilt, she's 20 years old, she's young, she ain't got no kids, she's done finished high school. She's living in her own apartment with her friend Brianna who is from out of state and she's working at this restaurant as a hostess where she's like wearing these cute little outfits and cute little skirts. So you can just only imagine the vibe. It's giving like hooters or that type of thing, right? And she was in her element. She loved working there. She worked there with a bunch of other girls. She was smiling and laughing and known to just be like a very friendly young 
young woman as a hostess. Heather was so friendly and flirtatious that she actually began to develop feelings for this man named Sidney Moore, who was working as a kitchen equipment repairman at the Tilted Kilt. Sidney was 37 years old and was also married. I don't know if Sidney was wearing a wedding ring to work or if she just didn't care, you know, being 20 years old, working in this industry, working in this restaurant who probably has a lot of guys that come in on their lunch breaks and stuff like that. She's constantly flirting, whether the guys are married or not. I don't know those details if she knew he was married she eventually found out, so regardless, but she had this crush on him. She thought he was so fine. She even made tweets on her Twitter that said things like, the guy who builds things at my job makes me cream myself. Wet dreams tonight. One of these days, I will drag that man into the mop closet and have my way with him. Lord have mercy. So those tweets that we just went over were on July 7th of 2013. Just three days later, the tones in her tweets kind of changed a little bit. Heather tweeted again saying, baby did a bad thing. She also said, I'm in way too deep, but watch me get in deeper. Friends and coworkers would also say that Heather would often discuss her relationship with Sydney with them as well. So kind of like everybody at this restaurant, the Tilted Kilt, knew that there was something now going on with Heather and this kitchen equipment repair guy, Sydney. It got so bad that Heather even got in trouble by her manager for using her phone up at the hostess stand. And I don't know about you guys, y'all ever gone into a restaurant, okay? It's one thing if you go to the bathroom and listen, I worked in food service for years and I truly loved it. But it's one thing if you go into a restaurant, maybe you're going to the bathroom and you see a server back in the cut or back hiding on their phone. But if you literally have the hostess up at the stand texting on their phone, it's not a good look. So the manager saw her up there texting on her phone and she told her to get her phone away from the hostess stand. When she told her to get her phone away from the hostess stand, this is when the manager said that Heather asked to charge her phone and the only place that she could really charge it was in the office. The manager said that this is when she saw text messages on Heather's phone between her and the married equipment fixer guy Sydney. First, uh, when Sydney started working there, he met everybody, he was friendly with everybody, um, and Heather seemed to have a fondness for him. Um, and they started hanging out at the host stand and talking, having conversations. Um, one in particular that um, set a red flag in, in my head was that um, they were talking about how they had had sex on the um, back patio of Tilted Kill. Now, while they were both at Tilted Kill, he's bringing her coffee. You've seen these text messages between the two of them. Um, what was your understanding of the relationship? Of uh, Heather, okay. Um, I figured they were seeing each other. Um, I didn't have confirmation until I actually read the text messages in the phone. Okay, so kind of like boyfriend, girlfriend. Yes. Now, it didn't just stop at these text messages. Sydney began to come into the restaurant on his days off, on days that he wasn't even there to fix equipment. And not only did he come into the restaurant, he came in there to see Heather, and he would bring her things like coffee and bagels and donuts and little snacks and was just doing like little nice things for her. And everybody in the restaurant was seeing it. It was becoming very obvious that now you have this man who is 37 years old and married and also works at the restaurant coming into seeing the 20 year old Heather hostess who was just all giddy about her little relationship with Sydney. But there was even a rumor going around that Sydney was trying to come up with a plan to get Heather to be a nanny to his kids like in front of his wife. Like, can you guys imagine like coming up with a plan? Like, okay, with his little, his little mistress, right? Like having her come and babysit his kids 
in their home. I just can't imagine that that is true, especially when you find out about Sydney's wife. Sydney would later say that his affair with Heather only happened in the month of September of 2013. And later in the month of September, Heather tweeted out that once upon a time, an angel and a devil fell in love. It did not end well, which has since been interpreted as referring to the relationship ending between her and Sydney. This is when we bring Sydney's wife Tammy into the picture and you guys when y'all hear about these things here that this woman allegedly did like first of all before we go any further I want to say that this is a triangle now or about to be when we talk more about Tammy where nobody's doing the right thing okay you got 20 year old Heather that don't give a dang about nothing in the world I mean a, a lot of us was 20 and did some crazy stuff right okay we all know by 21 I was in prison but then you got 37 year old married with children Sydney, who is so bold, he's even going up there on his day off in front of all these people, openly having an affair with this woman, uh, with this young lady. Now you got Tammy, and Tammy finds out about the affair between him and the hostess, Heather. And when she found out, she became angry, super angry. According to Brianna, Heather's coworker and roommate, Tammy made Sydney call Heather and end the affair right away while she was listening in the background. Brianna said that Sydney had told Heather that he wanted nothing more to do with her and that she was just someone who spreaded her legs for him. And Brianna, Heather's roommate, said that this tore her apart, said that Heather was so upset, she was crying, and she was devastated about the phone call. It just really shattered her and hurt her. And around this time, Tammy, the wife, would open up to one of her friends and tell her friend about the affair, but say that the only thing that her husband and Heather had done was oral on each other. It didn't go any further, and that luckily she got in just in time, and she found out, and her husband stopped the affair and called her and told her that all she was was a piece of meat and that she, there was nothing else to worry about, basically. However, that was not true. Now, whether Tammy believed it was true or Tammy was just lying, and we're again, we're going to get more into Tammy here in a second, it wasn't true because Heather and Sydney were we're having the whole way. And we know this because Heather's manager would go on to say that she saw text messages between Heather and Sydney saying that they were even having relations on the back patio of the Tilted Kill. Tammy, the wife, must have known something more was up because around this time, Tammy started sending explicit photos of her and her husband doing the nasty to Heather's phone. So Heather's just sitting around opening up her phone and seeing pictures of Sydney and his wife doing it together. I cannot imagine that, y'all. Can y'all imagine? Can you imagine being, she's bold too, Tammy's bold. All these people are bold. The wife sending photos of herself getting down with the get down to the mistress. Them photos could have went viral. They could have ended up on anything. Like all three of these people at this point, I'm just not understanding how they're like, this is, this is really happening. This is when it said that Tammy, who's not only sending these photos to Heather, she was allegedly handcuffing her husband to the bed at nighttime to make sure he didn't leave. And when I found that out, I'm trying to figure out what, how did he sleep like this? How did you have him handcuffed? Was it by the hand? Was it by the foot? Does he sleep like this? Does he sleep on his side? How are you handcuffing him? And who wants to live like that? And it didn't end there. It was even said that Tammy changed Sydney's password on his phone so only she would know what it was and she would go in there, check his messages, go through every little detail of his phone constantly. And it's also said that Sydney, the husband, agreed to all of these like rules or stipulations in order to save the marriage. And I'm, she had to have something on him too, more than just an affair. Like imagine being handcuffed to the bed, okay? Imagine, you know, somebody having the password to your phone, you don't have it, agreeing to take photos of yourself being intimate with your spouse so you can send it to the other person. There had to be something going on with this couple that 
one like one of them had something on the other for the other one to agree with it. I just cannot imagine that there's two people that are that crazy at the same time, but maybe they were because they were married and they were together. Because it didn't end there. Tammy even allegedly made her husband Sydney get a tattoo of her name across his crotch. And none of this was even enough for Tammy, the wife, because she continued to harass, and it is even said stalk, Heather at this point. She would even send threatening texts to Heather implying that she was going to kill her and even kill her husband. Then on November 1st of that year, Heather finally texted back that she was no one that Tammy needed to worry about anymore. She was done with Sydney, but that didn't make Tammy happy. She was trying to get Heather fired from her job at the Tilted Kilt too. Tammy began to call the Tilted Kilt repeatedly. She was calling it over and over again. She was saying things like, her husband, Sydney would not come there and fix any of the equipment as long as Heather was working. And Heather would even go on to say that she got cut from shifts because Tammy kept calling up there, calling up there, calling up there. So it was just too much for them to keep answering the phone calls and dealing with it. So they would just cut her from the shift. Then at one point, Sydney supposedly started to text Heather again. And when he texted her, he said that his wife actually wasn't mad at all. She wasn't mad about the affair because she actually had someone on the side too, but she was mad at him because he lied about it. Heather then asked him when he would have his phone back and he responded saying that the relationship was over. She agreed, but she said that she wanted Tammy to stop calling her work. Heather told him, I lost so many hours today because they sent me home because she just keeps calling and calling and calling. But then on November 5th, Heather tweeted another tweet. And at this point, it did kind of seem like maybe, in my opinion, Heather was poking. Heather was poking the bear. And the only thing I can think of is Heather being 20 years old, just really thought, I don't know if she was in some sort of competition with this wife, Tammy, or if she really cared about this guy, Sydney, and really wanted to be with him, even though he was married and had kids and had a whole house and da 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 and was obviously, I, I, I don't know. But she posted a tweet where she retweeted a joke by a comedian that seemed to be indirectly referencing the affair. And it said, hey, married fellas, you can either cheat on your wife or murder her. Never both that's when you get caught. Then later on November 19th, Sydney, his wife Tammy, and their two children left South Carolina to go to Disneyland for a vacation. They came back on December 11th, and man, that was a long vacation. By the time that Sydney and his wife Tammy and their kids got back from the vacation, Heather allegedly had moved on. They had been gone for three weeks at this point. She was, you know, not talking to him. She was telling her friends at work. She was telling her roommate she was done. She was moving on. She was done with him. Everything was going to be fine. She was tired of the harassment. She was tired of playing games, being involved in the games. And you know what? She was moving on. She had even gotten a job at a beauty salon in Myrtle Beach and she started just before Christmas. She was super excited about this job and she even started going to church regularly with her roommate, Brianna. However, Heather had started to put on quite a bit of weight. And the reason why this is important to talk about is because she worked at the Tilted Kilt. And again, like we talked about in the beginning of this video, they wore very small outfits, little tops, little skirts. And when you put on weight and you're walking around in that type of outfit, it's kind of obvious. I was in charge of the uniforms at Tilted Kilt. So um, their bra, their shrug, and their kilt were all provided by us. Um, she had to change her um, bra out from an A cup to a B cup and then later to a C cup and also she needed a bigger uh, kilt. People, including Heather, began to wonder if she was pregnant. What did she think was causing these physical changes? Um, at first from the A cup to the B cup she really wasn't thinking much, just that she gained some weight. Um, but then she started to get concerned um, when she had to go to the C cup and get the kilt. Okay. And to your knowledge, did she ever take any kind of pregnancy test? She took one at Tilted Kilt in the, in the restroom, yes. Okay. And if you don't mind, uh, did you see the pregnancy test? I did. Okay. And tell this jury what it said. It said error, and I went in, into the office and looked up why a pregnancy test would say error, and it said that either it was inconclusive or she did not urinate on it enough. 
So at this point, it seemingly nobody still knew whether she was pregnant or not pregnant. On the night of December 17th, Heather went out on a date with a guy that was her age and she was super excited about it and Brianna, her roommate and other people that knew her and her friends was excited. She was getting over this guy. She, she still didn't have the whole pregnancy thing settled out at least publicly, nobody else knew. And she was gonna go on this date with a guy her age and just kind of start over fresh. The guy's name was Steven. Steven drove Heather around in his car so they could look at Christmas lights in the area. And they later drove to a parking lot of the Inlet Square Mall where he taught Heather how to drive his manual vehicle. Heather even sent photos of herself using a stick to her father and to her roommate, Brianna. I saw an interview where Heather's father was saying that he chuckled when he seen the picture, but also kind of like, mm, because he said that he tried to teach his daughter Heather how to drive a stick shift so many times. I can't drive one either, okay? But he tried to teach her so many times, so when he got this photo of her driving a stick shift, he thought, he was proud of her, but he was also like, dang it. Steven dropped Heather off at her apartment at around 1.15 a.m. and he was the last known person at the time to have seen her. 20 minutes later, a call was placed from a payphone to call Heather's cell phone. The phone call lasted about five minutes and shortly afterwards, Heather called her roommate, Brianna. Brianna was out of state visiting her family for the holidays and Heather said that Sydney had called her telling her that he was planning on leaving his wife. Heather told her roommate, Brianna, that Sydney had asked for her to meet him. And allegedly, according to Brianna, Heather was hysterical. She was crying, she was so upset, she didn't know what to do. He's calling her out of the blue, saying that he's leaving his wife and he wants to meet up with her, probably saying he missed her, he loved her, who knows all the things that he probably told her. But nevertheless, Heather was just upset. Like she didn't, you know, she didn't know what to do. Brianna said during the phone call that she had told her, just sleep on it. Just wait and see, just sleep on it and think Think about it and maybe readdress it tomorrow. Heather agreed and told Brianna, you're right, you're right. I'm not gonna go meet him. I shouldn't go meet him. And they got off the phone. Unfortunately, that would be the last time that Brianna would talk to her friend and roommate. Heather's whereabouts have not been conclusively established beyond 1.45 a.m. on December 18th. The next night on the night of December 19th, Heather's vehicle was found abandoned. Her green Dodge Intrepid was found parked perpendicular to the spaces it was in at the Peachtree Landing boat launch along a river about eight miles from her apartment. The car was locked and when it was opened, Heather's phone, keys, and purse were not inside. Calls to her phone went unanswered and she was not at her apartment or either of her jobs. Before realizing how serious the situation was, the police allowed Heather's father, Terry, to come there pick up her vehicle and drive it home without any kind of forensic fingerprints or anything done in it. Just let him drive the vehicle home. And yet, not long after, the Horry County Police started a missing persons investigation looking for Heather Elvis. Naturally, the police went and interviewed Steven, right? Because he was the last person known to be with her for sure. I mean, there was the photo, again, of her driving his vehicle. So they went and checked him out. Not only did he willingly take a polygraph test and pass, but he was quickly cleared that he had an alibi and he had nothing to do with the disappearance of Heather. Later, searches of the riverbed by a team of rescue divers also turned up with no clues, as well as a search around the area of the boat landing turned up no clues either. Investigators were able to get Heather's phone records, which showed a lot of activity for two hours after she had told her roommate Brianna that Sydney had called her that night, although they cannot say whether Heather was the one using it or not. Pings showed that at around 2.30 a.m., a call had been made from the phone to the payphone that had made the the call Heather said was from Sydney, but no one answered. Shortly afterwards, it was taken to Longbeard's Bar and Grill for about 15 minutes. After the phone left, it was taken four miles away, but then it returned to Longbeard's for another 15 minutes. At the end of that time period, a call was placed to Sydney's cell phone, but was not answered. Heather's phone then appeared to be in motion, suggesting it had left Longbeard's, and within five minutes, it was back at Heather's apartment and remained there for another five minutes. During that time, it called Sydney's phone again, 
with his phone being located at his home, resulting in a four minute conversation. At 3.37 a.m., about eight minutes after that call ended, the phone was taken to Peachtree Landing. A minute later, three attempts were made to call Sydney's phone within a period of two minutes. All were unanswered. At 3.41, another attempt was made. A minute and a half later, data records for Heather's phone end. Its location could only be identified as somewhere in the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. Investigators believe this is when Heather's life was taken. So at this point, investigators, they don't have much. They have Heather's phone going all over the place, looking like she was blowing up Sydney's phone for some reason. Going one place for 15 minutes, going back to the apartment, going 15 minutes, going to the boat landing. All of these like cell phone pings all over the place. Then ending up at this national like wildlife refuge, which when I'm researching this, so many bells are going off. Like them, them searching the waterbed and not finding anything, looking for her since her car was left there. And then me thinking about the Kylie Rodney case and them literally being right over her car and not finding it. Or when we talk about this national refuge and then them looking there and not finding anything. And then I think about the Brian Laundry case. So I'm just like, okay, how good did they search? Nevertheless, at this point, because she had been blowing up Sydney's phone and they find out about the affair, naturally, they want to go and investigate Tammy, the wife, and Sydney, the husband. But during the police's investigation, this is when they found what would seem like a gold mine during the investigation because they found video surveillance footage that would link Sydney to around Heather's whereabouts on the evening of December 18th. Surveillance video from a Myrtle Beach Walmart showed that at around 1.12 a.m. that night or early morning, Sydney entered the store and purchased cigars and a pregnancy test. He left after seven minutes and then surveillance footage would show him at a kangaroo store using the payphone. Investigators also reviewed footage from private security cameras along the three miles between the Moore's house and Peachtree Landing. There was two, one at a home halfway along the route and another closer to the landing. The footage showed a dark Ford F-150 passing in the direction of the landing at 3.36 and at 3.39 a.m. At 3.45 and 3.46, the vehicle returns going in the opposite direction. The license plate isn't visible. However, after analysis and enhancement of the video, it was determined to be Sydney's truck and then was later searched. Now, during this time from December 18th, when Heather went missing, they were going through Christmas. Okay, investigators are looking into things. They've got their eye on Sydney, uh, especially, but they, they haven't been able to get anything concrete. We're going through Christmas, we're going through New Year's, and then we come to February 21st. The police closed off the section of Highway 814 next to Sydney and his wife Tammy's home to execute a search warrant for the property. After law enforcement thoroughly searched their home and their property for 11 hours, hours okay 11 hours they were digging through everything they arrested sydney and tammy they were both charged with murder kidnapping obstruction of justice and two counts each of indecent exposure that resulted in them finding explicit photos of them two like doing it in public places like what on a playground you know just doing it and taking photos of themselves listen no shame to anybody that does anything but we're we're deep in this case at this point we're invested and I'm thinking about it and I'm like okay the obstruction charges against Sydney were later said to be resulting from his early denial of his use of the payphone had you used any other phones that night your wife's phone no did you make any pay phone calls? Nope. I still have pay phones. There was a phone call made to Heather that night from a pay phone at the gas station on 10th Avenue. Okay. But we have video from that. Okay. Did you try calling her just a minute? No. A second? You sure? Maybe. Okay, how about we start again? I, I did. I called her from okay, the payphone. Okay, what did you say? I asked her to please leave me alone. The police did not go into detail about what evidence supported the murder and the kidnapping charges. However, security camera footage from their home that was showed during the trial showed that they were out there deep cleaning 
their Ford F-150 truck right after the incident, which we've seen this a million times. They've gone to all these stores. They've used pay phones that have cameras. They've gone into Walmart. These people obviously don't watch any kind of true crime at this point. And now they have them on video deep cleaning the Ford F-150 after she goes missing. There was even more footage that was shown of Tammy seemingly using a mirror to inspect a water fountain that they had in their yard. A month after the arrest, the courts imposed a gag order Order on all participants in the case and investigators also announced that they would later be making additional charges unrelated to Heather's case that instead involved financial discrepancies filed with the state of South Carolina on behalf of the occupants of the residence. They even got these people on Medicaid fraud because of them not actually reporting the amount of income they had. It just really seemed like the police and the investigators were trying to get them on anything and throw in everything at the wall to make sure something stuck. Initially, the couple drew heavy support on social media. You can only imagine, right? You got the young 20-year-old hostess who is being very open online about her attraction to this married man and maybe even seemingly poking at the wife at different points. And people were really taking Tammy's side in this situation. I mean, Tammy and Sydney had already been calling Heather a stalker on various sites, specifically their Facebook pages, suggesting the police had framed them and were protecting the real killers. Heather's family did try to fight back and defend her, but they were just so overwhelmed and attacked that they just, they just couldn't. They could not fight against it. In early 2015, the couple were released from jail where they had been held for 11 months. At the bond hearing, prosecutors told the court that they still had no direct evidence linking the couple to Heather's disappearance. Everything was circumstantial evidence and they didn't have a body. So it was kind of like one of them situations where you knew that they knew, you knew that it seemed like they've got something to do with it, but there's no body, there's no evidence. They cleaned everything up and what do you do? So they were out on bond. Heather's family argued against this release and claiming that they had received threats from the couple's family and their supporters. So the court required Sydney and Tammy to agree to GPS monitoring and to stay five miles away from the Elvis family home at all times and to avoid interacting with any of them on Facebook or any social media. However, due to the continuing threats that Tammy and Sydney were even getting, the judge allowed them to move to Florida because they couldn't find a job up there. Nobody wanted to hire them up there where they were from in South Carolina. The word was all over the place. Heather's body is still missing. And so the judge did agree that they could move to Florida. And then in March of 2016, the courts had to drop the murder charges because they had no proof that they had actually done that to Heather. They still did not have a body and the couple were not talking. Heather's family was obviously just very disappointed that the charges had been dropped because this, this was like a situation where it was like, it seemed obvious something happened, but nobody knew exactly what happened. So therefore it could not be proved what happened. But nevertheless, the Elvises, Heather's family understood. And at this point, all the other charges still, you know, had stuck the kid and the obstruction and the other charges. So they were just kind of hoping for the best when they went to trial. And so then comes the trial. In June of 2016, the first trial related to Heather's disappearance took place when a jury was seated to decide whether Sydney had actually taken her or not. Over the next four days, the state presented its case and Heather's coworkers testified that she had had an affair with Sydney and that they all along with Heather herself believed that she had gotten pregnant. As a result, law enforcement specialists documented the phone and the video records that the prosecutors argued that connected Sydney to Heather the morning that she disappeared. The jurors were even taken to both Peachtree Landing and the Moore's house. The last day of the trial was taken up by Brianna's testimony. She described the affair between Heather and Sydney in detail and became very upset recalling her last conversation with Heather. After deliberating for seven hours, the jury told the judge that they were divided. 10 of them wanted to convict, but 10 did not. And due to a hung jury, the judge declared a mistrial. All right, the record reflect that Mr. Moore is present. I've received a note from Mr. Lang, and he indicates the jury is still deadlocked and will be unable to resolve it. The jury has received instruction. They are still deadlocked. Therefore, this 
we'll I'll declare a mistrial. And this case will have to be tried again. The exhibits can be retrieved. Let me, anybody wants to go ahead and lead now, you may do so. I'm going to bring the jury in and discharge him. On the trial second day, Sidney actually spoke to the media. Because of that, he was actually found in contempt of court for violating the gag order. The judge sentenced him to five months in jail for violating the gag order by speaking to the media, but he was released after two for good behavior. Court proceedings on the case would resume over a year later. Sidney was tried on the obstruction charge, a rare instant of that charge actually reaching the state in South Carolina. The case case again focused on the cell phone records and video from the morning Heather disappeared. And as the prosecution attempted to prove to the jury that Sidney's initial denial that he had made the payphone call to Heather hindered the progress of the investigation. After just three days, Sidney was convicted on that charge and the judge sentenced him to 10 years for that. So you can tell right there that it even seemed like, in my opinion, the judge knew we're gonna get him for something. Like, we're gonna make something stick. So we gave him 10 years for that. And in April of 2018, a grand jury indicted Sidney and Tammy on a single count of conspiracy to kidnap. Then in October of 2018, five years after Heather disappeared, and again, by this point, they ain't found no body, nothing, okay? Tammy goes to trial, and this was a media frenzy. Everybody had an opinion about this. The prosecution even introduced the threatening text messages that she had sent Heather to support the state's theory that Tammy had been driven into a jealous rage when she knew of Heather's possible pregnancy, giving her a motive to hurt her. And Sydney's mother actually got up on the stand and testified that a few days after Tammy had found out about the affair between Heather and Sydney, that Tammy allegedly beat the dog doo-doo out of her husband. I'm talking about beat this man. So she allegedly beat this man, y'all. She was handcuffing him to the bed, allegedly. She was looking at his phone. She probably had a dog shock collar on him too at this point. She had to have. She probably had a Apple AirTag taped to his butt crack. I mean, this woman controlled this man. And during the trial, there was even like intimate text messages that Tammy was sending her lover. So Tammy actually did have a lover too on the side. When Tammy took the stand in the trial, she said that she had actually had a nice conversation with Heather the month before her disappearance and resolved any issues that the two had had. The defense would then later call her sister Ashley to the stand. Ashley, the sister, got up there and testified. I'm sorry to be laughing about this, but this is just so ridiculous. Ashley gets up there and testifies that her sister did not handcuff Sydney to the bed in order to keep him in the bed, but they liked it. They liked it. It was just like a little thing that they did. The defense also got Ashley to talk about the night of Heather's disappearance. She said that she had been watching the couple's children until 3 a.m., but that wasn't unusual for her to be watching the children that late because the children were homeschooled and it was just a normal thing. Tammy had texted her at 3.10 a.m. saying that her and Sydney were home. On the stand when Tammy was testifying, she said that they had went out the night of Heather's disappearance and they went out to have relations in one of the public places that they love to have. And they decided that she needed to go and have a pregnancy test. And that's why he went to Walmart to get this pregnancy test. They had excuses after excuses and they had years to pull together their stories. However, it did not work because after 11 days of a trial and four hours of deliberation, Tammy was found guilty and he ended up getting found guilty as well. And they were both sentenced to 30 years for this kidnapping which is truly a miracle, okay? This type of thing doesn't typically happen like this. I mean, do I need to go down the list of cases that we've talked about where the persons get off or the people get off or whatever? It is just like, it seemed to me, and this is my opinion, that the justice system is known to find loopholes sometimes and, and do things, but this time it seemed like it, it went out in the, it went in the right way. They both got sentenced to 30 years. Now they have both tried to appeal things and so far nothing has gone through. I did see an interview with Heather's parents where they were talking about how it still feels unfinished. And I can only imagine they still don't know what happened 
with Heather. So what do I think happened? I obviously think that they did something to her. They killed her. I think that they, I don't know if they tried to make her do the pregnancy test. I don't know if Tam, they beat her. I don't know what happened, but they could have done anything. I, I went down the rabbit hole trying to figure out like what people thought. And I've seen so many things with an out, they, they dumped her body in one of those like lakes and an alligator got her. Or that the, I definitely think her body probably went into water somewhere. Maybe fragments will come up one day and maybe they won't, but I am, I am glad that they were able to at least get them on 30 years. But you never know. One of them might get mad at the other one and decide that they're going to go and tell everything and lead them to a body. But the thing about it, since they both got 30 years, there's really no incentive other than pure spite to snitch on the other one because they're going to both be, you know, roped into that. I don't know. The taunting on the social media, you never know who you're taunting. You might be taunting a crazy person. And obviously, in my opinion, Tammy was next level crazy. When you're handcuffing your husband to the bed and sending your husband's mistress photos and stuff of y'all doing it and going in public places today, I, I, I don't understand. I, I don't know. Heather didn't know who she was messing with. She was messing with the crazy people. And this is just what we know. Imagine what this couple did that we don't know about. If this is the things that we do know about, you can only imagine what else went on in their marriage. What do you guys think? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Other than that, thank you guys so much for being here. I love y'all. I hope y'all have a wonderful weekend and I will see y'all next week. Bye.